Disclaimer! The views and opinions expressed on Nerdytalk do not reflect those of Anime Herald. Due to strong language, listener discretion is advised. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Well, hey, 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 everyone. It's time for Nerdy Talk. I'm Mike Fry, and I'm joined this week by Matt Brown. Yo, what up? As you can see, it's a slightly smaller group this week, but I think y'all still have some fun with us. Um, and what's on the docket today? Well, as you know, Matt, the new anime season starts very soon, and we've already got a list of the shows available. So, I was just wondering, what are the shows you are looking most forward to this fall? Mushishi. Mushishi is awesome, so yes. There were probably others, too. <laughs> but, possibly not. Only possibly? Most likely, it's most likely there were no others. No, that's not true. There was a new Gundam. Which yep. is pretty awesome because Tomino himself is involved. Let's hope it's more Gundam and less guards he's winning. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely no brain powered. Oh, God, no. And second season of Psychopass. That's going to be pretty cool. Although it's possible it won't be, but I think it will be. I just don't know what where they're going to go from here. I know. I mean, the first season told a pretty complete story. Yep. You know, unless unless the shit's going to hit the fan and everything goes up in smoke. Like usual. Yep. What was weird about that whole show was that they seemed, it seemed like this whole, like, um, society run by criminals or, or society run by a uh, criminally minded computer was uh, Jap- uh, Japan only. So what happens if outside influences poke their heads in? Yeah, they never really asked that one, that question. I mean, I kind of wonder myself, but... I can only assume it would be kind of a wake-up call from the UN there. Like, I could see just some inspector walking in saying... Okay, this is clearly not okay. We're going to have to ask you to stop this. Yeah. Although you know you know that not you know that there aren't UN inspectors in every single country, right? Only right. the ones that are suspected of wrongdoing. True. And who allow it anyway and stonewall the inspectors. True. So, yeah. Yeah, and New Tenchi Moyo. I wish I could care, but I can't because it, it, I think it's that like really short episode thing. It is, and it's not that really. Was, it was paid for by some Japanese city to promote itself. Yeah, it it's not really Tenchi. It doesn't even have the main characters in it. Yeah. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually looking forward to the second season of um, of uh, Chaika. Yeah, you really seem to enjoy that one. It was... I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say it was good, but it was enjoyable. And it didn't really... Like, it, it walked a very fine line because they... You know, it's a... It's it's a, a young girl is the main character. And um, she's being protected by... Um, you know, not not very much older people but um you know when you're talking about uh bad jokes you can make and and various other things the uh uh, it only takes a small number of years in between them for it to get creepy um but the show doesn't really you know it 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 i would say it dabbles a little bit makes you know little little jokes here and there but it doesn't it doesn't go into creeper land Oh, thank God. So as long as it keeps not doing that, I think it'll be okay. And the uh, the fantasy aspect of it is enjoyable. Hmm. I'll definitely have to give that one a look myself, actually. And I don't know anything about this Akatsuki no Yona um, from Studio Piero. 
Yes. But uh, just the fact that they're doing a fantasy show is interesting to me. Mm, it could be good. I, I like I like the concept, which let me just read off this description here for the listeners. An epic fantasy romance set in a country in ruins. Since Yona is the only princess of a grand kingdom, she has been raised with great care by her doting father and protected by her childhood friend slash guard. Hack? Hawk? Whatever. Um, <laughs> ha- ha- there we go. And others. However, her fate changed on her 16th birthday when her beloved cousin Su Wan murders her father to claim the throne. She flees the castle to Hack's home... And begins a new life. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah the epic fantasy romance. <laughs> well, <laughs> epic is probably not correct. No. Um, as long as there's as much fantasy as romance, it could be good. True. But uh, you, you never know. I mean, like, I I always I always make little jabs at. Uh, at the term romantic comedy, because there's almost no comedy ever. <laughs> yeah, it's... There's, like, no comedy. So... But, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm, mm. I'm mildly interested in that. I may... If it's available on Crunchyroll or the like, I will watch a couple episodes and decide for myself. Likewise. There may have been one or two... Other things? I'm looking through the list now. Yeah, and next season also we have uh, Ronia the Robber. Oh, yeah, Ronia. The Studio Ghibli co-production. Yeah. That will be very interesting to Mm. see if it's available in any way at all. Yeah, that's going to be um, Goro Miyazaki being the director, I believe, on that one. So... Don't go expecting, say, Sherlock, something on the level of Future Boy Conan or Sherlock Hound, but could still be really good. Yep. Let's oh, and there was a thing for a madhouse, too. Where'd that go? Kiseiju. Right. Kise madhouse tends to be. Um, pretty good, so I may give that an episode or two. Yeah, they're they're pretty consistent about their quality. They're, I mean, even their not so great stuff tends to be at least entertaining. Yeah, yeah. I was re- reminded of Madhouse because this and anim- this anime chart has a picture at the bottom right that looks like it. It's all looks like it's almost a teaser for more um, No Game No Life or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but. I would kill for more No Game No Life. Yeah, I I can't think of any reason why they wouldn't continue that show, but um, um, maybe just not yet. It might be a split season case where it gets renewed and delayed, kind of like uh, Attack on Titan was. Yeah. Next season, also we have uh, well, the... Attack on Titan had to be expensive. They had to oh, yeah. make make some of that money oh. back first. <laughs> well, the thing with Attack on Titan was they had to wait for more to be made. <laughs> Because by the time the episode twenty six came out, um, they still had a lot. They still didn't have enough ground to cover for a full series, pretty much. So, yeah, it's a common problem when there's manga adaptations. Mm. You you want to seize on the uh, the manga's popularity, but um, you know if if people have to wait a long time between anime seasons, then it starts to get tedious. Exactly. And I mean, it. I'm kind of glad they did that though. Cause I mean, they could have easily gone the route of like JC staff or Helsing and diverted well, well away from that source material, which doesn't always work out too well. Like you can tell that they're running on like a half baked. What do we do? They're still running. What, how can we get 52 episodes out of this type of thing? Yep. Well, and even the first season is, you know, it, almost every episode is good, but mm. uh, the if you look at the pacing of the plot, it is quite seriously dragged out. Oh yeah, it is glacial. It is definitely glacial. Like, I mean, we have seen ice ages that ended faster than Attack on Titan's arcs. Seriously. 
Uh, that was that was one show that I wish I had not uh, found it so fast. Mm. Well, uh, it could be worse too. Again, they could have gone and done an endless eight on you, which would have just infuriated most people. <laughs> well, I don't know. Mm. I I never I never actually watched the second season of uh, of uh, Haruhi, and I don't understand the motivation behind people continuing to watch endless eight. <laughs> I think now has become like, one of those... why, why would you, why would you not at least give it, you know, after the second episode of it, you should have under, you know, maybe you didn't understand the extent of the troll, but you should have realized it was a troll and, and backed off and waited a few weeks before continuing. Well, nowadays I think people do it ironically. Because they know it's there, they know what it is, and they just do it to say they did it. Like, yeah, but I mean, when it was airing, people were really mad about it. Oh yeah, I remember that. People were pissed, and they were turning it in record numbers still. Yeah. So, who's the one that who's the one that really won there? The the fans who got their second seasons are Keo Annie, who basically said, "We're doing the same episode eight times, and you're gonna fucking watch it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i think the oh this is kind of a side note but the the uh, one other thing that caught my eye which i'm not terribly interested in but i think people who follow type moon would be there's a new fate show I which was at, they probably all know that I, that's going to happen anyway i was actually just going to mention that because i'm actually interested in unlimited blade works because they're um, I have been watching some Fate Zero, and it is fantastic. It is it is really good. Um, I want to say Fate Zero is the uh, the guy that's um, the guy that's been doing. Um, I don't know if Zero is involved in that or was. Right. Must be something about things named Zero. I guess so. But. Yeah, I have really been enjoying Phase Zero, so I, I will be keeping my eye on Face Day Night. Yeah, other than that, the only other one I saw that really kind of grabbed me was... I mean, this the concept sounds silly, but it's a Sunrise show, so there's a good chance it's going to be awesome. Because, you know, Sunrise. Um, Cross Anji, Tenchi no Rio no Rondo. I mean, it could be really bad, it could be really good, but Sunrise is a company that got me... To, Emotionally invest in a show about school idols, and they're coming in that got me really pumped up by uh, Good Luck Girl. So I'm I'm interested to be yeah. to say lightly. Well, and it's it's in Sunrise's comfort zone. That too. Heavily mechanical. It's from the picture. Hmm. Our next topic. Uh, have you heard, man? Uh, Toonami's getting a new a uh, new series in their lineup. Helsing Ultimate's going to start on. On September 13th at uh, 3 a.m., basically taking over the spot left by Black Lagoon. Yeah, Black Lagoon sure didn't run very long, did it? Eh, it ran its course. Yeah. It ran its course, so I can't really fault that one. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know that they have a lot more choices these days, so I guess it's yeah. not like it's not like before where it would be <laughs> all Cowboy Bebop all the time. Right, There, it looks like they're actually, you know, trying now that they realize that there is a, an actual market that'll watch it <laughs> which unfortunately doesn't include me so while i while it's um encouraging news to for this stuff to show up on television i have no access to that so i can only care a little bit yeah i mean i'll be honest um i don't watch toonami myself because a lot of the stuff that's already on there i've seen a couple times before or i'll just catch on um either Hulu or Funimation.com afterwards. So, I will say it is it is really cool to see that going up there. But man, is it going to get ravaged in editing? I think because anyone that's seen Helsing Ultimate knows it's it's incredibly gory, incredibly incredibly crass. Especially when you get on um, episode two, I think it is. There's one guy who spouts out f bombs at a mile a minute, so that's going to be pretty much just bleep the episode, <laughs> or maybe just most of it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the rules are for 
things that are airing at 3 a.m., but they probably have a, a little bit more leeway. True, but there's probably still a standards wall they have to hit. Because um, I remember later episodes of Moral Oral, they had to delay for weeks at a time because uh, they kept violating the standards S&P. Yeah. It's kind of sad that it's that uh, they're just so terrified of the viewers complaining about that shit and of the FCC. Yeah, and honestly, at 3 a.m., if... And media properties don't make them enough money to really go out on a limb. Right. Although, more, moreover, I think at 3 a.m., it's more they're worried about which advertisers they're going to be able to attract from a show like that. Well, it's got to be pretty cheap anyway, so they shouldn't be choosy. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah, I, I know all that. Well, I, I don't know specifically how it all works, but... Um... When you deal with uh, big media groups who are buying advertising from you and they're all terrified themselves of lawsuits and whatnot. Right. Or diluting their brand by buying the wrong block. It pretty much comes down to everybody's scared shitless. Pretty much. But hey, every time Toonami gets a new show, that's pretty cool. Definitely. Definitely. All right, and, and I, I think Hel- I think Helsing was yeah. Well, the last thing I'll say, I think Helsing was. Is this the first Helsing that showed up on um, on Toonami? Uh yeah, it's the first Helsing to show up on American mm-hmm. TV. Just because, well, when Helsing but, TV came out, it was at that point mm-hmm. where the market was contracting pretty badly, and a lot of fans were kind of not happy with it. Yeah. I mean, um, I was just going to suggest that the um, I, I, th- I think if you compare Helsing to uh, the shows that have done well on Toonami, it's probably a good fit. Oh, yeah. That's definitely a show with broad appeal. It's something that will get some eyeballs for sure. I mean, the acting is great. The, the action is just amazing. And the story is surprise. It's it's very well done. All right. Um, moving on. Um I'd like to take a minute, a few minutes, and just talk about a Kickstarter project that um, that's really caught my eye recently. Uh, it's called Under the Dog. Uh, this is a an original anime feature based on a story by Jiro Ishii, who did uh, Kanan 999, and it'll be directed by Masahiro Ando, who did Sword of the Stranger, Kanan, and a lot of other stuff. And for those who don't remember. Uh, Ando was actually in consideration for an Oscar nomination for his work on Sword of the Stranger, so anyway. Uh, character designs will be done by uh, Yusuke Kozaki, who did uh, a lot of game stuff, including No More Heroes and the new Fire Emblem game. And basically, it's a sci-fi thriller set in the year 2025. Um, Tokyo Bayside District stands in the aftermath of a grisly incident at the Tokyo Olympics in which a group of, um, like, superpowered terrorists had attacked and led to pretty much a, a horrific scene. Um, in the wake of the day, the UN formed a special covert branch tasked with the sole mission of taking out members of the cell that would bring such destruction to the nation. Um, as a cover, the group built up uh, the International School for Boys and Girls, which is kind of like a... A government-run X-Men facility where they seek out and train the extra gifted high schoolers with the purpose of placing them into an elite death squad that would hunt down the the terrorists. Failure is not an option because the agents and their families are filled with like these cranial bombs that'll basically go off and blow up their heads in the case of a botched mission. Kickstarter has a goal of about $580,000. It ends on 9-7. It unfortunately looks like it's going to have a hard time reaching that because as of publication, it is at, uh, as of our recording time, it's at $328,838. So they have to, a lot of ground to cover in just a week. Could make it, but it's definitely going to be a tense week for the group. Have any thoughts on it, Matt? Well, yeah, they want, they need to make like 250 grand in. Mm-hmm. Seven, eight days, seven yep. days. That's a tall order. Definitely. And just as a reference, everyone, um, Prussian IG's Kick Heart 
made 200,000 in 30 days. So that's going to be a tough one. Yeah, I I think it's I think it's a hard sell for them because even even people that would be interested um you know, at the end of the day, what what they're doing is producing one episode of animation. Exactly. Um, and even, I don't know how long the episode was planned to be, but, oh, 24 minutes. So, you know, your typical uh, your typical OVA episode length, mm. you know, with, with the implicit promise of more, I would guess. But that's not very much when you're going to, uh, you know, even, it's not enough to do the big pledges, I think. Um mm. And that's that's where they're running into trouble. I'm sure they probably have a lot of small pledges, um, because you know uh, you know people who think yeah that's worth five dollars of my money. Um, hmm. Yeah, but, they have but, almost but not fifty or a hundred. You know. Yeah, they have almost five thousand backers, so they do have a lot of people pitching in. It's just it's the numbers are there, the amounts aren't type of thing. Yeah, I think that I think they probably have a large number of of small dollar backers, and maybe they maybe they should have made the uh, uh, the low end a bit a bit higher. I don't know. I'm not sure what would have got what could have gotten them there. Mm, I mean, it's kind of hard to say in this case because um, I'm looking now. They're they actually do have like a lot of people pitching in twenty five fifty bucks. It's but. But going higher than that, it's becoming like a, a tough sell. Like they need. Yeah. They need I could a... see. I could see anything up to fifty being, um, you know, people thinking that was reasonable, mm. especially people that paid money for like the uh, the Gundam Unicorn episodes. Um, right. I mean things like that. People who are are anime fans and they're used to um, spending a little bit more for for niche offerings. Right. I mean, the DVD, it's priced at uh, 60 bucks, and it's got almost 1,000 backers, so there's definitely a group that's that's interested, but, yeah. Well, you had an interview with the uh, uh, with Ando, right? Um, it wasn't Ando, actually. I, I was actually just going to bring this up. It was um, Hiroaki Yura. Um, right. Yura, that's right. I got that mixed up. Yep, Hiro Yura. Um, and it was really quite interesting. Like, he basically talked about how they wanted to basically break away from the production committees on this one which is particularly fascinating because we he did give some insight on how they work how they really can pull and change a project on its own and they want to do this as a pure animation project um basically when i asked them about why they went with the crowdfunding route they said uh yuda's son said well I think, as I said, we don't want to be involved with production committees because they have their own agendas about how things should be run. And I kind of have to agree there because there is definite politics. There's definitely the issue of things like they want they want to merchandise it. They want to tone things down or change things to make it more palatable to the average the you know the average TV watcher. Which I think more than politics, it's I mean this this is what was. What interested me about the project too, um, the they the their desire to uh, get out from under the um, production community umbrella, because that's how a lot of anime is made these days. I think mm. more more than politics, it's the uh, it's the individual business interests of the um, of the committee members, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because even nowadays, anime is um, a lot of anime is made to sell toys. I mean, it used to be the case um, pretty much with every cartoon in the U.S. too. But I don't know if that's still. I don't know if that's as big of a thing here as it used to be. Whereas in Japan, it seems like uh, merchandising is still um, a, a big part of the equation. Mm. Which yeah, I can see wanting to get away from that because that. Well, and the other thing is the. Um, uh, the production committees do um, they make a lot of shows possible that wouldn't be otherwise which mm. which you would say was you could say is a good thing but because they're bringing all of the money to the table they want all of the proceeds in return so right. the uh, the anime studio which usually goes into it with nothing um, they wind up being a glorified contractor and don't get any of the proceeds right so, so they don't have uh, they don't have any money to grow on, which uh, I think is um, 
a big part of why they're so concerned that they have no up and coming talent, you know? Right. Cause they can't afford to train people. Right. And where's basically going to lead to a, we're leading to a case where the industry is going to stagnate. And, well, I could argue it's already start. It's already in that period, but anyway, that's another story for another day. Yeah. It's hard to say. It, it seems like there's a lot more companies at work um, these days, but there aren't a whole lot of, pretty much none of them seem to stand on their own very well, True. except except for like the the big um, previously well established ones, like your like your madhouses and your uh, production IGs, um, maybe even uh, maybe even companies like Bones who do few enough projects that they probably they probably negotiate. Um, mm. Or way, ways to make it worth their while. Even Kiyoani at this point. Yeah, Kiyoani, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't really know. Um, they're they're a fairly new studio, so yeah. That's, that's what I mean. At I'm this not point. sure. I'm not sure if there's. I would have to go look. I'm not sure if there's anything that they've really funded themselves um, to to try and you know. Because uh, nah, think... it's it's hard for a studio to take that risk mm. on on a title which may not do well and then you know they're even more dependent on production committees yeah i i think the only thing they've actually done completely completely out of pocket was their original munto ova series which they only made two episodes and that's probably all we're going to see from them yeah and then i if i recall correctly it was well regarded but i don't know how well it did for them financially it, it was very good but yeah, I can't really see it being a huge financial success either. Yeah, I've read some commentary that puts the uh, puts puts the problem all the way back at um, at Tezuka, who made what people see in retrospect as bad deals uh, to get uh, animations done, hmm. and it and it kind of became the standard where the animation production company just wouldn't. They, they wouldn't retain any rights and they wouldn't they would hardly get enough to uh, to make the next title yeah I mean I can definitely see the blame there um, I can definitely see a lot of a good reason for that anger being directed back but it's, it's not really it's not really anger just anybody looking at the history of of how anime has mm. been produced um, some of those people point the finger at Tezuka for for why uh, studios are so dependent on other companies. So I definitely understand the desire to, uh, to get out from, mm. um, you know, to stop being part of that machine. Oh, but like, it, it, at least at the moment does not appear that uh, Kickstarter is the way to do it. Not yet. I mean, we're, maybe, we... maybe foreign investment would, uh, would help out. It's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, we did have some cases of that happening in the anime boom, remember? Um, ADV did co uh, did fund a few shows, as did uh, Jenny on Universal USA. But, yeah, going directly to the fans, while it's admirable, while it is a nice thing to have and to see, the amount that's needed to get something like a 30-minute a animation project is just... It's stratospheric in terms of cost. They never it You'd neither need either incredibly wealthy benefactors... Or just a lot of luck. I mean, yeah, you do see a lot of game Kickstarters really push that limit. Like, um, I can think of a few where they broke three, four million dollars. But video games also have a much greater reach than anime. I mean, so it's one of those things where it's like I can see it. I do kind of respect their goal, but it would have well, to be like one of those joint approaches where they can get some investment on top well, of the Kickstarter money. And the thing is, when when backers are paying for a game to be created, um, that's like uh, that's like a complete entity in itself. You know, when the game is done, it's done and shipped, and everything after that is profit for for the maker. Right. And you know, everybody gets their copy. They're happy that that they you know made it happen. Mm. Something like this, um, people who back it are. I feel doing so with the uh, 
you know, the implicit expectation that there's going to be more to come after the thing is made. Mm, I can definitely see that. And if there is, how many of those people are going to come back to back again? You and I both remember well, seeing it, those drop It may off. also be a reason for people not to back because True. they don't they don't think I don't know. It's it's hard to say. It, I just don't know. Neither do I. But it is quite an expensive thing and maybe they didn't do a maybe there are some people who would be interested but they think the $580,000 um number is inflated or greedy mm. it's it's really hard to say i mean just yeah. reading over the the entry i don't know i don't know if what they're saying is true and that it really costs that much you know where does the money go they're not really telling us right i can't really comment there because so so yeah um yeah i don't know i mean i i think it, w- it would be nice if this worked out for them it seems like it's probably not going to but maybe um, maybe they'll find another way to make it happen. They, I believe in the interview, didn't they mention that they've already gotten um, offers from broadcast companies and they just didn't want to go that route? Yeah, here it is. We already have offers about trying to get it out on TV in 26 episodes, but we don't want to do that because it's not what we set out to do. There we go. Um, so, yeah, they do. It looks like there is definitely a backup plan there, so... Yeah, it's hard to tell if they'll even do that. Maybe yeah. maybe they'll accept the offer because they, I think they definitely want to make the thing. But it's it just comes down to um, they probably have other projects going on and they don't they don't need necessarily for you know it's not do or die necessarily for this to happen. Right. This is more of a we want to do it. This is what we hope we can get done type of thing. I hope we hear more stories of of companies, um, of production companies finding a way to um, uh, to fund their own projects and keeping um, a significant chunk of the proceeds. You know, I think that's mm. important long term for yeah. for that industry to Definitely. survive. Definitely, because even just for as a fan, I want to be able to see stuff like this because. It's something where the concept sounds really cool, and it's something where if they do make it, they can get they can make the product they want to show us, which would be ideal. Um, I, th- I think it's important for morale too. You hmm. can't just be dependent on handouts from others. I, I think right. that uh, wears you down. Right. Because after a while, it just becomes that case where you're going in and you know you're just doing this for somebody else. Yeah. Like I said before, you know, a glorified contractor. Yeah, exactly. And a, a creative, uh, a creative company like that, I can't imagine them enjoying that work. Mm-mm. Not, at least not long term. Likewise. All right, our next topic uh, for the evening. Studio Ghibli co-founder Toshio Suzuki basically pointed to uh, Ava creator Hideaki Anno as the spiritual successor of Miyazaki. During a stage presentation for the Tokyo International Film Festival special presentation of the world of Hideaki Anno, um, Suzuki basically spoke about Anno's role in anime, uh, present and future, and insisted that after Miyazaki, the next brilliant mind in anime has to be Hideaki Anno. Here we go. Uh, Suzuki was quoted as saying, I am certain that Anno will be the one to lead Japanese animation to the next decade, and only people with talent can create. I would like him to cherish the God-given talent and keep producing. So, while Anno has no plans to join Studio Ghibli because, well, he has his own studio at this point. Um, He has Kata. I figured I'd kind of bring this out for conversation because it's definitely an interesting bit of news. uh, Something that... Seem to have slipped below the radar for a lot of people. So what I do you think have because there? they don't have any idea who Hideaki Anno is. <laughs> yeah, he's been kind of non-existent in the anime world outside of the rebuild of Ava films lately. I think his last major work, otherwise, was um, Rikuti Honey in 2006, 2007, in there. But yeah, um, he's been kind of just under the radar since then. 
Yeah. Okay. So first of all, it's it's. Um, I'm sure Ano sees it as a, a pretty big honor to be, you know, for uh, for Suzuki to say such nice things about him and for his work to be featured um, by you know the Tokyo Film Festival. Um, so that's got to be that's got to be pretty cool for him, especially given his I would say colored history as mm. an an as an anime producer or an anime director. Um, Actually, didn't he originally but, work as an animator at Ghibli? Uh, I think didn't he work on like Nausicaa or something like that? Yes, he did. He worked on Nausicaa. Yeah, I I, I was gonna say yes, but I couldn't remember um, which title he's worked on. So yeah, as actually as an animator, he was kind of all over the place. Um, and he also worked as as animator on some of the stuff that. Uh, you know, much of the early Gynax stuff, you know, before he was really cemented as a director. So uh, he's really been all over the place. So he, he I think, in, as far as Suzuki would be concerned, um, and, and Miyazaki, um, and Hayao, Hayao Miyazaki as well, um, Hideaki Anno came up in the right way, or the way that Miyazaki in particular would uh, would want to see you know continue and it's not just Miyazaki I think it's a lot of, of of senior people in the anime industry are lamenting the fact that there's no and we just talked about this that there's no um, concrete um, uh, training path or program for uh, animators these days um, who are based in Japan Right. Uh, it used to be that they would start as in-betweeners and and work the way up the ranks to a uh, key animator and maybe animation director, you know, or what, you know, a number of other ways, depending on what they what they chose to specialize in. And that that path, uh, that training path is all but gone with uh, mm -hmm. with in-betweens getting farmed out to Korea and China Um yeah, definitely, because, I mean, at that point, the lowest position you can really get is a key animator in Japan, and you really do lo lose a lot of exposure for new talent there, because while it's not a glamorous job, it was a great way to figure out who could really get somewhere in the industry, who really could stick it out. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so Hideaki Anno came, came up in what I think a lot of these senior people consider the right way, and... Uh, his so that's one thing for going mm. for him and the other thing i wanted to talk about before i really got into ano's works was um so we've it, it's a common theme and maybe it's more uh, more um important of a question now in people's minds but we have been looking for Miyazaki replacements, it seems, for a long time now, right? Yeah. Um, um, and, and, you know, it seemed like uh, for for any for any director that was doing well, the best thing that they could hear about their work was that they were consider that they were being considered as a next Miyazaki. Um. And so, you know, if you think about some of the people who've uh, who've gotten that you know, sort of pseudo honor, um, or, you know, at least people who respected the person enough to say that, uh, you know, when Miyazaki has gone, this person could, to, could definitely take the baton. Um, one of those people I could think of is, uh, Satoshi Kon, and unfortunately he's no longer with us. Another that I've heard this trumpeted a lot about was, um, Makoto Shinkai. Um, which um, his his movies have a big following, and um, they're they're technically sound, very well made. Um, and uh, the third person I was thinking about uh, that people have said this about was um, uh, Mamoru Hosoda, and he doesn't. He's I guess he's a I would say he's a little bit behind um, Shinkai in terms of you know number of number of works produced that would make people say things say that about him um but i've actually i'm not sure i've ever heard at least from fan circles and media anybody 
say that about Hideaki Anno and um, for Toshio Suzuki to say that I think is a pretty huge deal. Like he is, he he's saying, you know, no, you should be paying attention to this guy. Never mind those other guys. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is actually an interesting development because of that. Because over the years, we've we've all heard it billions of times. Like you said, it's um, we've heard it for Shinka, we've heard it for um, for Hosoda, we've heard it for. I've even heard it said a few times about Mamoru Oshi, which. Well, wow. yeah, I should have mentioned him as well. I've I've heard that too, but and well, and he's he's kind of um, I would say he's he's similar to uh, at least in at least in terms of how, what you know who fans would consider as a next Miyazaki. I think Oshi is, um, is another one that mm-hmm. people would just completely ignore because he's a little bit eccentric, even though he has the experience and he has the ability. Yeah, I mean, he's done some wonderful things in animation, but then he decides he wants to do live action a lot of the time, and it just comes out horribly. Yeah, I I find myself amused by his live action movies, but they, at least the ones I've seen, weren't serious enough to really analyze. It's just, well, this is interesting, <laughs> a little weird, kind of funny. You know, I come out of it thinking, well, neat. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're offbeat more than anything. Um, although the pet labor looks pretty cool on a on a random note, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was just seeing. I was just going through the list of these other directors in my head and thinking, yeah. um, you know, if if you let's let's take a look at Shinkai for a second because a lot of people have said, you know you know, trumpeted the next Miyazaki thing around him. And I don't think they're entirely unfounded in saying so. And if you look at his latest movie, um, what is, I keep forgetting the title, Children Who... Chase Lost Voices. Chase Lost, yeah, Chase Lost Voices. Um, it's very... It, it's it's very Miyazaki in style. It's like, it's 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 environmental... Um, ever so slightly, but not really abstract, but, and, and I, I think the, uh, you know, I think you're like, what is it called? The Quetzalcoatl monster, um, reminded me of something that could have come directly from Princess Mononoke. Mm. Um, but at the same time, um, Shinkai has, has been kind of in this funk where, um, his plots are all centered around uh, either loss or um, or perception of loss or or right. longing or longing for what one could have had. Um, you know that sort of theme. I mean, and it, even his latest movie has. I, I would say it's better balanced, but it hmm. definitely still has that as a strong theme. Yeah, I mean that's why. I know it's not a popular opinion, but I like to make the joke. You've seen one Shinkai movie, you've seen them all, because I mean they all have that same core, that same core theme running through them, and it's kind of hard to really escape that. Like it, I mean, as different in the movie the films are, they still feel in a lot of ways incredibly similar because of that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm even willing to forgive him for that because if you look at if you look at Satoshi Kon's movies, um, mm. they they definitely have they definitely have a signature and. Um, uh, the way, you know, the way the humor works, the way the, uh, um, you know, the visual direction, the, the way the stories play out are always very, um, they're always very similar, um, in, in the sense that they, uh, they're always sort of building up to this reveal. True. They, they do kind of have that, like... They all have that same basic flow to them, but I mean, yeah. he he was Although always much. Per, I guess Perfect Blue was a little bit more of a uh, a little bit more of a just a straight up psychological thriller. But sure. if you look at, um, you know, if you look at uh, Paprika at, 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 at Tokyo Godfathers, the um, the moments in that where there was. It, it was it was always like it, it always wound up at these moments where 
the the hurtful truth came out, you know, in one way or another. And then, um, well, Paprika was kind of a straight up adaptation of a novel. So that in a way that that followed the story. But um, in that case, Cohen kind of, you know, uh, changed change the order around a little bit in order to um, to have the same kind of flow. So I don't know. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting my point a little bit muddled, but he he definitely had a, uh, a a style that he was comfortable with. And all of his movies followed that that train. It just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't about plot. Whereas Shinkai's movies, they their common thread is that they all have the same plot. But anyway, uh, I was going to say about Shinkai that um, his he definitely has the ability. And I want to say a like his um, his ideas about uh, filmmaking seem to be in line with some of the stuff that that Miyazaki did. True. Um, so it's not it's not uncalled for to say, you know, you know, we really like this guy and he could be um, uh, he could be somebody that we look up to um, as kind of a, you know, a father of Japanese anime. But mm. anyway, when I look at somebody like Hosoda, his his um, it's like he's he's captured the uh, he's captured the childish wonder or spirit of childhood that you find in a lot of Miyazaki's movies, I think. Also does movies are very much about, um, you know, um, emerging feelings and growth, but they're also, you know, they're also very childish, um, or at least like coming of age childish. Mm. Like they don't, like they're trying to grow up, but haven't really managed to yet. They don't have that same weight and maturity that uh, lo- that seem to be in any Miyazaki films, that type of thing. Yeah, but they at least have a... I would say they have a Laputa or Kiki's Delivery Service level of maturity. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Totoro is a little bit more special. I was going to mention that, but it's... Um, I think Totoro is a bit more subtle in its message, and it's sort of a precursor to um, to the uh, well, not precursor, but it has uh, it has a little bit of Nausicaa and Princess Mononoke in it, if you really pay attention. It really does. But anyway, I mean, I, like all of those guys' work is is worth, you know, continuing to pay attention. Well, uh, unfortunately, we won't see anything more from Satoshi Kon. But all of those all of those guys' work, the ones that are still alive, are it's uh, worth continuing to pay attention to what they do. You know, even though they may not individually be able to. Um, command the same sort of respect that Miyazaki did. Absolutely, absolutely. But then when, when we get back to, and I'm glad you mentioned Mamoru Oshii, because I sort of have the same feeling about both of them when this topic comes up. Because it's like, you know, both of them are very, you know, they're, they're, they're fiercely talented. They're, um, they definitely have strong ideas of of how their films should be made and their and their tv shows um and they've both made things that are um you know they both made some very weird things and they both made some things that are um uh, that are you know mainstream appeal at least in japan and i can't help but think that most people wouldn't get it why somebody like Toshio Suzuki would point to somebody like Hideaki Anno and, you know, or Hoshi, or Hoshi in our hypothetical <laughs> um, and say, you know, this is the guy. Mm. 
I mean, and I, I find it, I find, I'm finding it difficult to put a finger on it myself, but I can't help but agree. I mean, he, um, Anno has, has a very unique uh, style and a, a way of, um, you know, even uh, there's so much of his stuff that has like, um, I don't know, there's there's some of his stuff that's very, uh, uh, very fan service-y, but at the same time, it's so, it's so real. I don't know. I'm having I'm having trouble yeah, putting I, a finger on it. Likewise, I mean, there's something about his work that it's just it's tangible. It's definitely there, but it's also at the same time utterly indescribable. Yeah, I I, I feel especially like the later the later stuff that Gynax put out that you know even though even though Ano wasn't really um, he wasn't behind that as a director. I feel like they all tried to make things that that he would make in. You know, with that, with that same, like, you know, ooh, look, you know, boobs and ass, but yeah, but it's, uh, it's, but holy shit, something with serious gravity just happened. Yeah, which is what led us to Gurren you know, Lagann, Panty and Stocking, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, when you know, when I think about something like Ame Nobashi, which that that show is just, you know, it's ninety nine percent silliness, but. Mm. The one percent that's serious just fucking floors you. Mm. It's just something that'll tear your heart right out. It it really is. Which is it's like that was the brilliance of the show though. That's what really made it something incredibly special, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, and, the, and even looking at the stuff that uh that Anno directed himself, like um I I continually point to Karekano as um as an example of, you know, yes, it's a manga ad- adaptation, and the uh, the original manga has, um, is is also, you know, it's very good. But Anno made the anime his own, and he, um, I feel like he made it even even funnier, and the emotional moments hit even harder because he was behind it. Definitely, he made a much more charming show out of it. So yeah, I'm not really ex- I'm not really explaining myself very well mm-hmm. here, but I would just I would just conclude that uh, um, you know I'm not surprised that that somebody with the clout of Toshio Suzuki would uh, would honor Hideaki Anno in such a way. Indeed, because he has he has much more talent than I think people give him credit for. Oh, definitely. I mean. And I think that's that's part of why he's had so much difficulty in his career, you know, at least from the little bits that that we've been able to hear. I mean, you know, it's it's why he, you know, after Kari Kano, you don't see much of him at all in animation. No, after Kari Kano, um, he did some work on Abinobashi. He did like a storyboards and key animation on a couple episodes. Um and he did re uh re honey which was brilliant by the way um any licenses please 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 bring that here i will buy it i will pre-order it and i will i will basically sing your praises on this podcast but anyway <laughs> um but other than that it's just been pretty much rebuild of evangelion yeah and i know we didn't i i kind of purposely didn't talk about evangelion yet because um, you know, even though it's it's part of um, you know it's a good showcase of what he's capable of, uh, or um, you know then and now, and it's um, you know it's a very a very high quality show, very good show. But at the same time, um, you know it's widely widely known that he was um, extremely depressed while he was making the show. Mm. So it's hard to like one of the reasons why I like to point at Kare Kano instead was because he he definitely seemed to have come out of of whatever mindset he was in while making Ava. And you and it and in that show he shows just how good humored he is and just man, I mm-hmm. that show had me laughing out loud so many times. Oh god, it was a it was a wonderful show. Not to mention there's a couple of live action films like Funky Forest. 
Yeah, I've seen clips from Funky Forest, and it's it's incredibly funny. I I want to see the whole thing, but I just haven't had the time. Likewise. But yeah, he's actually made appearances in a lot of um a lot of live action things. Most of them just cameos, but um I think he's in pretty much every episode of Funky Forest. I think so. Which is hilarious because he's like, you know, he's like this middle aged guy and uh, sitting. In a middle school class. Yeah, in a classroom, <laughs> you know, as a student. It's it's so funny. Just just his being there is funny. And that's the that's the kind of thing that Anu himself brings to the table. He knows um you know, he knows how to make that quirky humor. Definitely. I think pretty much everything that else that we can say about him is just um, you know, he's he's ex- he's experienced and it shows. Oh yeah, his his career is basically a testament to everything he's been through. It's it really is. But all that said, I'm not sure if he would want to make movies like my Miyazaki did. He makes movies like he makes them, you know. Mm. And I think that's why we love him so much because he does his own thing. He's not constrained to trying to absolutely be the next Miyazaki. Because I mean, Miyazaki wasn't trying to be anyone. Miyazaki was making what the hell Miyazaki wanted. You know what's also interesting, though, is that he, um, when it comes to animation, it seems like nobody wants him to make anything but Evangelion for pretty much ever. (laughs) And he's, you know, if he ever got, if he ever got offered um, a directorship at uh, at Ghibli, which probably, you know, I don't think that would happen, but, um, you know, let's just say for the, for the sake of, of, of argument that he did, um, it might be a way that he could break out of that mold and people could see him as somebody other than the Ava guy. Which would be it. fantastic. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I guess the only other thing that um, probably neglected to mention was that um, um, if you look at if you look at Nadia, which Anno directed, mm-hmm. it was it was one of their his earliest shows. Um, it's Partly because it was inspired by Laputa, which in turn was inspired by um, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Um, it's it's very um, it's very in line style wise with uh, the sorts of things that uh, Miyazaki did. So you could almost look at that as an example of how Hideaki Anno could be a Miyazaki. That is true. That's a good point. But I almost didn't want to make that point because it was kind of it was quite a long time ago that he made that. Yeah, that was the eighties, wasn't it? It was ninety. Ah, like nineteen ninety flat year. Yeah. All right, so transitional period. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and our final topic for the night. Um, basically, what are you watching? Nothing. Okay. Because I'm talking to you. Oh. Oh snap! You got me there. Snap. I forgot to make a list this time, but I am watching stuff. There is the the usual two, the uh, the Saturday afternoon shows, SAO and um, Ald Noah Zero. Both of those had very good episodes this week. I'm I'm definitely still digging it. Um, and Ald Noah in particular seems to up the ante every time, and um, it's it's been like I haven't seen that kind of bravery in a while. You know, t- typically the um, and I don't I don't know if it's just the source material, but t- typically anime producers really drag things out. Like they they use the they 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 do things in the TV way, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Um, every episode and, and as I would say SAO does this, but every episode sort of like, um, uh, it, it hits all of the characters just to make sure that they're not being neglected too much. And then, you know, either, either a big reveal at the end or some kind of cliffhanger and watch next week. But, um, I would say Ald Noah doesn't really do that. It's, you know, it certainly is is paced like a serial offering because it has to be. It's, you know, it's too, it's it's not like they have it all worked out. 
but um, it's not it's not afraid to take the next step in every single episode. Um, I don't know if it's just because they don't expect it to last past a season or um, and I, I would say that that's probably the you know the common case mm. or or maybe they have several different um, arcs planned with different characters each time that that's another possibility. But, um, you know, TLDR, they, um, keep it interesting. Uh, whereas SAO is pretty much keeping it interesting with, um, the prescribed amount of action per episode so that you don't get bored. So yeah, that's all I have to say about those two. I'm still watching a comic I kill, um, so, um, you know, it's still typical Shonen. Um, they, they did, you know, a big fight in the last episode and, uh, it continues on to the next episode, <laughs> uh, which I haven't seen yet. Cause that's tomorrow. Um, but you know, I'm still enjoying it. I, I know what kind of show it is and I know that it's gonna take time to really, get anywhere and if i really wanted to i could stop watching for a few episodes and then just marathon it but it's fine i've got plenty of other stuff to watch and nobunaga concerto is actually so i i said early on that uh, the first time i watched it that it, it seemed like it was super low budget but now i'm not so sure of that anymore and i i didn't you know i don't know the actual budget numbers um and it seemed now I'm starting to think that they did it in the style they did because it was more like it was more like the style of the old um, woodblock uh, paintings from the era, you know. Right. So I, I think it's you know it's very it's very two dimensional and there's there's animation going on, so it makes it seem a little bit weird, you know, almost almost like the movements are are somewhat like uh, the, you know, e- even uh, what South Park does, you know, that sort of thing. But it's not like, it's not cheap looking. It's just, I think it's just the style that they chose. Um, so I kind of wanted, wanted to correct that thinking. But um, also, it's still, it's still kind of holding my interest. Um, it's it's an interesting period, you know, a lot of war going on, but the, you know, how they uh, uh, how they kind of threw in this whole um, people coming back from people coming to that period from the future thing um, mm-hmm. makes it even more interesting. So I'm having fun watching it. I finished rewatching the Kyoto arc of uh, Kenshin, which is you know it's very good. Pretty much everybody knows that. Mm. I totally forgot how bad the episodes immediately after Kyoto were. <laughs> oh god, they're yeah. just, oh man, they're so bad. They are terrible. And I, I don't, you know, and they're they're working. Yeah, you know, after a few more episodes, they'll get to the uh, the whole, you know, Christian rebellion arc, which, um, unlike a lot of people, I don't. I think that's. I think it's fine. I I enjoyed it well enough. It's not as good as Kyoto, but um, I didn't think it was bad. And then that's when I'll stop watching because I I know I know that everything that comes afterward is just terrible. Yeah, it just goes downhill from there. Yep. So, um, but you know, overall, I think Kenshin's a very good show, and unlike a lot of people, I. I even like the first season. I feel like I'm missing something. That... Oh yeah, I just found this today. There's a uh, a special. A well, they're they're calling it a episode eleven to twelve special of uh, Mushishi. So um, kind of like how they opened up this uh, this previous season um, with a uh, with a forty five minute special. They did the same thing for the uh, for the in between period. Um, which is kind of a nice way to say that look for more Moshishi in October, which but is a uh, good it's, it's just like a, it's just like an extended episode and very good. Just like all the previous offerings. I can't really say anything bad about it. 
I'm, I'm watching other stuff, but I won't talk about that because I'm doing it for write-ups and various other reasons. I'll just talk about that stuff later. Fair enough. <laughs> um, me, this past week, it's just been really not much at all. Um, I've been watching Kendaichi, which is still wonderful. Um, I did have to do a little bit of review work on a uh, little review rewatching on uh, Codebreaker, which, if you recall the last episode, that show is on my shit list for the blatant display of animal abuse. It still is, and it kills me. I- it kills me because after that first episode, it does get orders of magnitude better. Like it scales I, up. I think on you're it. a masochist for rewatching shows you don't like. <laughs> oh, I am. I'm I'm a terrible person in that regard. But anyway, um, otherwise, the only other show I've been watching is uh, Card Capture Sakura. Um, everything else has just been back burner at this point. Oh, and Strange Plus, because the episode's like two or three minutes long each. Is that still... Are you still enjoying that? Strange Plus? Yeah, it's got its moments. It's not the greatest show in the world, but it's entertaining for what it is. Kind of like I, My, Me. It's two or three minutes of concentrated insanity, and it's good for a quick laugh. Yeah, it's it's very silly, but I, I found myself laughing a couple times the, the uh, few episodes I watched, but just kind of dropped it. Yeah, it's one of those shows where you kind of go in once in a while, you watch two or three episodes, laugh, and forget about it for a while. Yeah, there's not there there's not that many shows like that where I can just keep watching. Um, Galaxy Angel was one of them, although it's it was those were 15 minute episodes, but still, you know, kind of kind of same principle. It's it's just a silly show, and it uh, it kept my interest, but most of them don't. Never marathon Galaxy Angel, by the way. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> you you will be fucked up by the end of by the end of Al- Galaxy Angel A. But in a good way. Mm-hmm. Then there's Galaxy Angel X with the the blue haired chick that keeps dying. It's wonderful. There were so many of those shows. Uh, let me see if I remember my my lineage correctly here. It was Galaxy Angel, which aired on a satellite network. Then they came with a uh, Galaxy Angel Z, which moved to a different network, which is why they started censoring things like uh, Forte and Ronfus Cleavage. Then they had Galaxy Angel A, Gal- Galaxy Angel Double A, uh, Galaxy Angel S, which was a, a half an hour OBA that was between A and Double A that was released, and then Galaxy Angel X is the last in the main franchise. Um, after and that, that was all like one after the other, right? It was bang, oh yeah, bang, that was bang, just bang. that was just bang, 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 bang. Like, like you for a good three or four years, you couldn't go a every TV season had Galaxy Angel in the lineup, which I wasn't complaining. I loved it. Um, then you had Rune, which nowhere near as good. It to, it dialed back on the silly and gave a more grounded approach which kind of hurt a lot of that wacky charm it was closer in tone to the pc games at once to the actual anime series before it, which is kind of a shame yeah when something like that gets serious that's when it that's when it's all over big time it's a shame because i i do i adore galaxy angel but i know it's a show that has like very little chances in hell of coming out again it's been a very long time since the original I My Me. Like mm. I want I wonder why that um I wonder why they brought it back all of a sudden. Um well for my understanding, my understanding is this is I My Me originally was like strawberry eggs or something like that, wasn't it, in the US? It was I, my, me, strawberry eggs. Yeah. Right. So let me see if I remember this correctly because I did do a little research. Strawberry eggs was basically I, my, me, the actual core series, is actually a short gag manga about um about this high school manga club where basically it's silly. It's it's definitely weird, but very funny. Um, but incredibly fucking weird (laughs) um but strawberry eggs is if i remember correctly it's kind of like a um 
a manga within a manga type thing where it was it's like the kujibiki unbalance of that world where it was a series based on something that they did in the i my me comics that managed to get a full tv show hmm. now i my me strawberry eggs is also incredibly freaking weird it's basically a high school comedy about this teacher a male teacher that cross-dresses to work in an all-girl school it's offbeat i will say that to, to be nice it's offbeat um, or, it's, or it's the other way around <laughs> <laughs> uh, i've shown it at bands and i've had people say why did you show me that <laughs> i don't want to know this exists oh was it bad i didn't know um it's not bad but it's just really strange I see. Um, that was Genion, right? Yep, that was... Actually, no. Before Genion, it was Pioneer. Yeah, well... Like, in... I consider them the same. Yeah, but I, I do but and fair. I don't. Yeah, I yeah, use yeah. Pioneer as a... I use it as a timeline, like... Genion years or later, years Pioneer earlier. Yeah. I think that company had... <laughs> I think the company had the same problems all the way through, but uh, Genion was just the beginning of the end. Oh, yeah, because Pioneer got lucky with the Pokemon buyout. and yeah. Dragon Ball and Tanchi. They got lucky with a lot of early hits. I think they were probably, I mean, it ended badly for them, but they seemed, I think they had the best longevity of of any of the... Um, you know the big boys of the old the, days any any of the domestics that were um governed by a parent company you know well viz yeah viz somehow has still made it work <laughs> i think it's because they are they're governed by you know they're they're not i mean they're part of the uh they're part of the domestic anime business but they're not their parent company is not an anime company Right, it's uh, Shogakukan and Shueisha, which are book companies. Right. So their their primary focus as a business has never been anime, and all of the stuff that they've released is animation, you know, stuff that, um, well, I wouldn't say all of it. That's not true, but a lot of the bets that they make are things that they expect to have big reach. You know, the the bleaches, the Naruto's, the Death Notes. And they occasionally made um, made risks on um, on shoujo offerings because mm. sh- sh- even even here shoujo manga is popular enough, but it just didn't translate into anime um, anime popularity. So um, they kind of lost out on some of that stuff. But they, I'm not sure that they really backed it in the first place. Anyway, they just wanted to see how it did. True, true. But now they have the now they have Sailor Moon, the ultimate shoujo title, which there's almost no way it won't do well. Yeah, I mean, if that I just, shoujo... don't, I just don't think it's going to translate into other shoujo titles doing well necessarily. Nah, I I do hope they don't take this as signs of a trend or anything like that because Sailor Moon is definitely the anomaly. Yeah. Well, Sailor Moon and Cardcaptor Sakura. I mean, I wouldn't mind them re, uh, retrying a run at Full Moon or uh, or Maison Koku or mm-hmm. a number well, of other things, but well, I have as heard, long as they put the whole damn thing out, you know. <laughs> I have heard teases of Maison Koku, so yeah, that one well, could happen. I think we would all love to see it happen. Mm. But it's hard to... S- it's a hard know, sell. Yeah, it's hard to say for sure. I don't know. It's it doesn't have the pull that something like Inuyasha did, right? Because or, or even UI. Hmm. UI. The problem was it went on too damn long. Yeah, but I mean, Animago was able to sell, you know, twenty, thirty, forty volumes of the stuff <laughs> before before most people got bored. True. True. But I mean, that was when it just ran way too long. Like, um, I've only got the first 20 volumes and that's enough for me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I just I just don't know. I mean, stuff like uh, Inuyasha and Ranma have 
um, they kind of hit the sweet spot, I think, of, um, you know, people who like Dragon Ball Z would at least consider watching those shows. Mesa Nukoko, not a chance, <laughs> at, least with, at least with that group. Yeah, that's a very, very targeted audience. Yeah, it's 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 funny and really enjoyable, but it it's um it appeals to adults. So sure. you have you have to consider it along with things like maybe uh uh maybe Holic, another clamp offering. Mm. Or I, I say another clamp offering, a clamp offering. <laughs> we haven't talked about clamp at all tonight. Yeah. And Clamp does a lot of the same stuff that Takahashi does. You know, it's like they they have like these, you you know, they have two main characters and ten thousand spiritual entities that they interact with. Mm. That's that's why I kind of thought about Holic because it's it's a show made for adults, but um, um, you know, it's it's this it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's the same. Although Meso Nukoku doesn't really. That's just a straight up adult comedy. Mm. It's it's really rare considering the other stuff that Takahashi wrote, you know. It really is because a lot yeah. of her, most of her other stuff has some sort of spiritual slash yokai um, inspired mm. sort uh, a thing. And a lot of her stuff tends to typically appeal to like that younger set, like. Rama Inuyasha. Um, most of her most her best known stuff tar- targets that young set. I mean, yeah, she's got stuff like one ton, go- uh, one pound gospel, but those seem to be like blips in in the much larger body. Yeah, and I read a little bit of Rinne, and that seems to appeal to the same core group as yeah. Ranma. It does. Man, I would what I would give to get more Rumic World though. Yeah, I never actually saw any of that stuff, and I wish I had, because I know uh, I've heard from several people that it's very enjoyable. Mm. At the very least, watch Rumiko Takahashi anthology. Um, it should be cheap to get, and it is fantastic. It's basically, um, Takahashi does slice of life, and it is wonderful. All right, and that's our show, everyone. Uh. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Till next time, I'm Mike Ferris signing off. I'm Matt Brown. Thanks for listening. And remember to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and be sure to rate us. It helps us out a lot. Thanks so much. Have a great and see you next time. When we originally recorded this episode of Nerdy Talk, um, Under the Dog still had over a week left, and it was sitting at about $300,000. Our previous comments included a lot of general skepticism that it could really make the goal even though we had hoped to see it actually happen i mean i think i personally even said that it needs some nothing short of an absolute miracle so i guess we're eating crow right now as at the moment under the dog is over seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in funding with 16 hours left so i just wanted to kind of get some commentary on that since this is an absolutely unexpected turn of events it's a fantastic one and i think it definitely bears some revisiting um so what are your thoughts matt well you could say we're eating crow or you could say they got their miracle that is true and that miracle was hideo kojima he's basically the oprah of uh gamers and anime fans alike if he says to do something they do it yeah oprah is a good <laughs> analogy <laughs> uh It'll be an even better analogy when Oprah yeah. starts making these. Uh, I'm compl- thinking about what the Hideo Kojima book club would be like. <laughs> oh God, that would be absolute trolling. But yes, it certainly helped them to a <laughs> significant degree that he got behind their project and told the internet to basically do so as well. Definitely. And oh. um, there was another thing too. There was the. Uh, uh, he did a Reddit AMA yeah, um, about producer, the project. Yeah, producer H- Hiroaki Yura took to Reddit IAM, Reddit IAM um, to answer questions about the project, which I'm guessing a lot of people were expecting the standard PR fluff, which you see in a lot of you know producer AMAs and stuff like that. But this guy went full Bullworth. I mean, 
he went out there and he literally said what was on his mind about everything, which I think impressed a lot of people. Yeah, it's almost like it's almost like Kojima's support um, emboldened him, and he was able to speak his mind on why you know why they were really doing this, even though a lot of his answers were were similar to what we had heard already in in his interview with you and. Um, you know other sources and even the the website the Kickstarter site itself um, I think uh, he he gained the confidence to uh, to really you know he, he knew he was uh, on the right track uh, and the project was on the right track and that they were doing the right thing you know at least in their minds so um, it's good to see, and it's especially good to see that they've succeeded in getting the funding that they need to make this episode. Absolutely. I'm definitely looking forward to the project. The, the other thing that strikes me is that um, in, 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 the days of the, uh, in, in the days of the anime boom, in, if we even should call it that in the U.S., um, I don't know if you recall, you probably recall better than I do, but there were some seriously high um, licensing costs for a single episode of anime. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, during the anime boom, I, I can actually rattle off a couple because we have some documents from an ADV case. Um, I know for a fact that Kurao Phantom Memory costs over a million dollars an episode. Yeah. And if you if you compare that insanity to like you know here's this here's this brand new project and they said it's going to take five hundred and eighty thousand dollars to make the thing from scratch and give you uh, or at least the people who've pledged enough uh, a Blu-ray video of it five hundred eighty thousand dollars. You know, it really, yeah. if, you, if you consider the excesses of the boom, that really puts it in perspective. Because, um, you know, let's face it, it's um, half a million dollars is a lot of money. And it seems like, you know, and I, I think I even said this in, in our previous recording, that it was a lot of money and it wasn't obvious, you know, why it cost that much, maybe. Mm. I think that's, that's what I was thinking at the time. And... Um, you know, on reflection and just thinking about what uh, what people would get charged in the boom days just for licensing after the thing that had already paid for itself, you know, mm. in times over. It's definitely, you know, that, that 580000 seems cheap now. It really does. And I'm looking forward to my Blu-ray. I didn't spring for the Blu-ray for uh, various reasons. Mostly, well, don't have the cash right now, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know why I did. Oh, yeah. You, it's there a 5.1 mix. There was a promise of 5.1, and hell yes, yeah, as it, far as I'm concerned. Definitely. It's going to be a fabulous feature. I, I'll definitely be watching the download when it comes out. Because I did, I did definitely get in, get in on the ground floor for the digital edition. Now we enter the uncomfortable period of waiting for the thing to be made. But, yep. um, you know, I have to say, I've, I'm hopeful that it's going to be very good. And, you know, just because, I mean, there's no guarantee that it's going to be good. Um, but, uh, just... Based on everything we've heard, they have complete creative freedom, and yes, that means it's also pos- that means it's possible that they're gonna fall in their faces and everybody will be disappointed. But it's also uh, it also means that we're not going to get a Moe feature no matter what. Oh, thank God! <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, and as I always tell it, people... It definitely seems like it's going to be a net good, even if I don't like the result. And as I always tell people, I'm not a Moe fan. Feel free to like it, but I absolutely abhor most of it. And if you don't like it, come at me, bro. Well, and, and Yura himself said that um, something along the lines of um, he thinks 
he thinks moe is fine but mm? uh there's way too much of it and i that i definitely agree with that i don't think definitely. i don't think all of us went into the moe craze hating moe i think we got tired of the fact that it was still a craze after all this time <laughs> exactly i mean when it was just kicking off i mean we all liked stuff like uh, Melancholy at Heart, He's Suzumiya, or Lucky Star. But it just, after a while, it just became overbearing. It really did. Yeah, and on top of that, it's like, it, it almost seemed like the worst fetishes were being um, passed off as mainstream, you know? Anyway, back to the topic. <laughs> Actually, do we have anything else to say about that? or? I mean, we didn't have that much to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I thought the interesting thing is, like, just how much of a criticism that Yuta san gave to us production companies. Like, um, during this AMA, one of my favorite quotes was, they don't want to take risks with innovative or edgy ideas for anime. They just want to do the anime as selling well next door. We want to make the stories that we find interesting. Right now, that is Jiro Ishii's World of Under the Dog. We're not overly concerned with what the investor will be interested in, they fo- they will follow a product that has a proven fan base. So, I mean, definitely some truth moments there. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's hard to even follow it up because it, it seems to us like common sense. I don't know. It makes you really wonder how messed up that industry is. 